Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. So my name's Hugh de Kretzer. I'm the Executive Director of the Human Rights Law Centre, and uh, I'm not an artist. Well, I'm an amateur artist, but I'm not, not a good artist. Um, so, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a bit about my journey towards art and human rights and, and about meeting Bill. Um, and, uh, but firstly, let me introduce the panel. So um, maybe I'll start with Sean. So um, sh I'll cut this down a bit, the bios, but Sean's a, a very well-known artist, illustrator, um, Academy Award winning um, for his um, uh, short film, The Lost Thing, which won the Academy Award in 2010. 11, 2011. Um, he comes from Perth um, and we we're talking before about his experience um, finding his pathway as an illustrator and um, and has done some really moving work, uh, particularly around the migrant experience and um, our interaction as a society with issues around human rights and peace and war and um, other issues. So we're really privileged to have Sean here tonight. Um, next to Sean is um, Lauren, on Sean's left, Lauren Valmadre. So Lauren's the Program Director at the Human Rights and Arts Film Festival, um, a really fantastic festival that has come from um, a, a bunch of volunteers um, that have grown something into what is now a national festival, great, getting great audiences um, and expanding into, uh, from films into literary work. As well. Yep. Visual art, music. Yep. And so um, Lauren has um, previously worked as, at the Melbourne Queer F Festival, the Melbourne International Film Festival, um, and has programmed uh, for other um, performances as well. Um, and was recently on the pitching panel at the Australian International Documentary Conference. Next to Lauren is Bill Kelly. Um, so Bill is a painter and printmaker uh, who was born in New York, um, who has a, a real leading international reputation as a, a humanist artist, an artist who is concerned with themes of peace and human rights and um, standing up for the courage of people who have stood against war and stood up for peace. Um, he's a Fulbright Fellow, a former Dean of the Victorian College of Arts, and his work has been exhibited in more than 20 countries and reproduced in publications worldwide and represented in more than 40 public and corporate collections. And he has an amazing international network of friends and artists and colleagues in uh, the peace movement. And to my left is Reiko Okazaki, who is also a lawyer and, uh, and the chair, not the chair, the general manager of Right Now. So um, Right Now is an independent not-for-profit media organisation focused on human rights issues in Australia and it's really great having Right Now and, and HRAF here because they're two organisations formed at a similar time uh, that have really grown out of volunteer efforts into um, and re really made their mark and landmark on the um, Australian scene and promoting human rights in different ways. Uh, so Reiko is a barrister at the Victorian Bar and previously from New York. Um, uh, so she practices as a lawyer, but also um, volunteers as the general manager of Right Now um, in terms of putting out literary publications online about human rights issues. So my own um, background in relation to the arts, um, I'll start with um, when I met Bill Kelly at a conference where I was doing a comedy debate and I had been um, working very hard on criminal justice issues and talking about very serious issues. And then I was invited uh, about to um, turn all that seriousness on its head and deliver the same content in comedy format. And uh, I found the experience uh, liberating. Um, and uh, Bill came up to me after the conference and we started a conversation. That was back in about 2007-ish. We started a now 10-year conversation about art and human rights, and it's a conversation that um, I have learnt uh, a lot from and has helped me be a better human rights advocate and a better human rights lawyer. Um, as Bill is always keen to remind me, my wife is an artist as well, so she's involved in art and public art and promoting social causes around that. And one of the exhibitions that she took me to was by an American artist called Jenny Holzer, which was down at Acker. And um, she had worked with the American Civil Liberties Union, which is an organization that does similar stuff to what the Human Rights Law Center does. 
um, and they had had these freedom of information battles with the US government to expose uh, the abuse of detainees in Afghanistan and Iraq. They had got, in the same way that I would do this, run these freedom of information battles, get reams of information and say, there it is, that proves the abuse, that proves that detainees were killed, that proves that detainees were murdered. What Jenny Holzer did as an artist was take very selected chunks of information, just lines. The detainee died by blunt force trauma in the autopsy report. Um, bits of information that showed the connection between the policies that the White House were endorsing and the, um, the implementation of those policies in the notorious prisons in um, Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, it really opened my mind up to a very different way of using the information that I would use as a lawyer to say, here are the facts, you must agree with me, and she's inviting you to think and pers be persuaded and to open your heart and your mind to what the US government with its allies was doing to detainees. And more so, as, as we grow as an organisation, we've been around for about 11 years now, we are doing less strict law and more um, thoughtful advocacy. And, I, and I'll just give you two examples before I, I hand over to Bill to start. Um, one example is around what's happening in our offshore detention centres. Um, and there's a communication expert called Anat Shankar Asaria who was brought out by the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre and she did great work looking at the way that we communicate as human rights advocates about the, um, uh, the horrific treatment of people in immigration detention centres. And her um, strong message for us was change the way you talk about these issues. If you talk about torture, if you talk about um, taking Tony Abbott to the International Criminal Court, you will activate a small base of your supporters. If you talk about people seeking safety, people trying to rebuild their lives, people fleeing persecution, people trying to have a future for themselves and their kids, you are going to reach a much bigger part of the Australian population and actually engage with them in a human way. What um, one of my human rights heroes, Brian Stevenson, who's a lawyer in the States, calls proximity to try and get that human connection. And so one of my colleagues, um, Daniel Webb, who's been to Manus Island three times, the last time he went, he went with a portrait photographer. And he, uh, that photographer, so Daniel was interviewing the men there, finding out their stories, and we know about the horrific conditions. These were stories about what they hoped to do, whether it was repair bicycles, listen to music, paint, um, raise a family, become a human rights lawyer, become a writer to try and provide that human connection. And then the photographer took portrait photos of these guys not looking dejected or um, beaten, which many of them are, but looking hopeful and proud and human. And um, those portraits became the men in Manus and some of the um, people who are now communicating directly to the Australian public, like Beirouz, like Amir, like Imran, are some of those men who's, um, who we were able to provide a platform for in a very human way through the work that we're doing. Um, that, that last thing, last example is um, some work that we're doing at the Human Rights Law Centre with partners around the detention of um, kids in the Barwon adult prison. So following all the disturbances and unrest and riots in youth justice centres, the Victorian government sent kids as young as 15 to Victoria's most notorious maximum security adult prison. And the conditions there were horrific, um, but I can't take a photo into a, a camera into a prison. I can't show you those conditions. Um, but one thing we did, we worked with Amnesty International who um, engaged an illustrator to actually illustrate the stories that the kids were telling us. Uh, stories of being handcuffed when they're buttering their toast, um, when they're let out of their cell, um, stories of being capsicum sprayed, um, uh, stories of being locked 23 hours a day in small concrete cells the size of a parking spot. 
So um, they're just some examples about how in our work as human rights lawyers and advocates, we're trying to engage with the values and the emotions that art so successfully engages with to um, get people to um, be proximate to or have that human connection to uh, the, the human rights issues which are at the heart of our work. Um, so with that introduction, I might hand over to Bill, and it's going to be Bill, Lauren, Sean, and Reiko, and then we'll open up for questions and discussion and dialogue. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, can you hear me? Is this working? <laughs> thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, uh, an, an absolute honor uh, to be on a panel with these distinguished people uh, as being somebody who, who spent three years trying to get out of grade one. Uh, I'm always a little intimidated when I sit on a panel that has a, at least two lawyers and other people who have educations far exceeding my own. Um, and so it's wonderful to, to be in a context where people have such an incredible worldly experience. Uh, I'm, on the other hand, probably a much more practical sort of person. And uh, in that, I want to ask, if you have not found the, your way to this brochure, poster, catalog thing for the exhibition, which is on level two. Uh, on your way out, if you please pick one of these up, because it has a lot of information about the exhibition and, and what's behind it. And then also, while you're there, there is a sort of a poster-sized image that has a text on the top that says, fellow travelers. Uh, it's a thing that we're giving to the city of Melbourne for hosting this, uh, and it and it's for people who are interested in these issues of human rights, social justice, and peace to sign their names on to be show that they're a part of the journey uh, with others. And then it'll go as a part of the collection for the city of Melbourne. So if you get a chance and you go to the gallery, please pick one of these up. And there's a pen right there by the, by the picture. Please sign your name to that. Now, uh, the reason that the panel is on and some of the other events have been that it's the, uh, built around the exhibition, which I was in, invited to, to hold uh, and decided to curate as a group exhibition. And although it's entitled Peace Not War, Art That Takes a Stand, it is art that takes a stand, but uh, it takes a stand on, uh, related to the issues more to do with the idea of if we live better together and share what common aims we can, and that the chances are that we won't have war. Uh, it's unlike a lot of things, it's not an anti-war exhibition in any very, very specific sense. Uh, there are a lot of works there that deal with other issues. Uh, and they include colonialism, and they include greed, and they include power, and they include gender issues. But most importantly, they include issues to, and, and images that artists have put together to deal with human rights and social justice. Uh, activism, and love. Love's not a word which figures very often in the art world, um, although some of the others do. Uh, the, dear, the thing about speaking of things like love and peace, they seem so soft in a world where the Australian government has just invested, I think it was $200 billion in, uh, uh, in the defense industry, and they're advertising for people to be employed to keep the $200 billion investment going. Half of that into education. Uh, social justice, human rights would, would do us very well. Uh, just 100 billion for those concerns would just go a long, long way. I think it would use budget uh, where he has to have fundraising events as well to keep things going, as I suspect Reiko does and, and the Human Rights Art Film Festival. Uh, so these, these issues are, are really quite one-to-one -one basic, how we relate to each other's individuals, but how we then transpose that or act on that in the rest of our world. Um, I see the exhibition as, a, as something of an active, uh, temporary monument to peace. If you look around Australia, uh, you will see thousands, and, and that is not an underestimate, thousands of monuments to do with war, wars, uh, generals, uh, uh, leaders of wars, uh, and, and I mean thousands. In the, um, and, and then it's the cannons, and it's all the, the implements of war that are in the parks for children to play on and all of that. If you then count the number of absolute 
rock bottom, no questions asked. This is a peace, a monument to peace. I'm not sure I could use all those fingers across Australia. Maybe, maybe those. And so what are we coming up to and what are we seeing every day on our streets, let alone on television or from our governments and, and all of that? So I think of this as sort of a temporary monument to peace, something that says look, uh, we can and need to look at uh, some of these issues. I was quoted some time ago as saying that uh, uh, a painting can never stop a bullet, but a painting can stop a bullet from being fired. And my experience of artworks like Guernica, uh, Picasso's famous Guernica, which has changed my thinking about the world, uh, the very famous painting photograph, excuse me, which is in the exhibition, uh, the Vietnam Napalm by Nick Ut of the young Kim Phuc running down the road, which is credited with helping to contribute to stopping the Vietnam War, uh, certainly stopped not only a bullet from being fired, but helped to stop many, many bullets from being fired. Uh, and I believe in the power of art. And, and I'm so uh, honored, I guess, in the sense that, that I'm often in company with people who share that belief, artists and, and other non-artists. It's the same thing with film, uh, writing, theater, uh, and as I was saying to Reiko uh, and Lauren a little while ago, artists need others to help provide the platform for the artwork. I can do all this stuff in a dark room on my own or in a, a room with light on my own, but unless somebody says, oh, I'd like to hang that on a wall, I'd like to show this, I'd like to show others, I'd like, to, I'd like somebody to see this, it doesn't go anywhere. And, and I think increasingly there's, there's a appetite um, in, in our country and also across the world in my experience that people are finding that the, the constant sort of uh, presentation of, of images that deal with violence and our oppression of others and that are, are just not right. And so they're looking for, for alternatives. Um, and as you know, or well, some of you might know that Australia is probably the most warlike nation in, in uh, the Western world. Uh, I, I, my homework tells me that it has been actively involved in wars for 70 of the last 100 years. Not only does America fight its wars and England fights its wars, but we fight America's wars and we fight England's wars. We fight other people's wars too. Um, 70 years is a lot of years. We, we are virtually in a constant sort of engagement, a military engagement. And now we're in the war against terrorism. And, of course, we have 16 years involvement in a war we never should have been in, as on most people's uh, perspective. Um, so, we've got to show that we can be better than this as human beings. Um, and, and we must find a voice, and we must speak up, um, and we must make our pictures, and sing our songs, and do our dances, and, and convince people in a very positive way that this is the right direction to go in. Uh, and we can't, certainly can't change the past, but I do really firmly believe that we have the opportunity to change the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, and I'd also like to thank the City of Melbourne for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel, particularly with such esteemed artists as Bill and Sean and such incredible lawyers as Hugh and Reiko. So thank you so much for having me this um, afternoon. Um, so my role uh, of Program Director of the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival, um, I've actually been programming for this organisation for seven years, starting as a short film programmer and, and now as director of the festival. And um, I've seen such incredible change and the quality and the quantity of content and the growing audiences and support for films like these to be made and showcased has really been quite astounding. Um, I, we do, at the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival, we do engage with uh, visual arts, performance, forums, literary events, but um, I'd like to speak specifically on film, uh, if I may, as that's kind of my area of expertise. Um, and what Bill said really struck me as um, that is what we try to aim to do at HARAF is to provide a platform for artists and filmmakers 
who are creating works with um, around the themes of human rights and social justice to have their platform and to connect with discerning and engaged audiences. And that's just something, you know, we really hope to achieve in our festival, we don't wish to be didactic or shove a message down anyone's throats. Um, that's the beauty of the art is that you will you will kind of take it take from it what you will your own messages, and hopefully it will. What we just hope is it will encourage discussion and foster a sense of connectivity um, and remind us that we you know we are all human. Um, and it's a it's a really wonderful thing to see to see the reactions from audiences particularly when they watch our films. Um, it tends to go to one of two extremes. Sometimes people will be absolutely um, infuriated or enraged by the injustices that they've seen and they'll want to talk about it um, very quickly and very um, all together just kind of up in a bit of a, a strut. Or they might see something that has really deeply affected them emotionally and they might just need a, a moment to contemplate about what they've seen. But um, one thing that we can definitely tell from these films is that um, they're undeniable and they're unforgettable. You can't shake off these stories because they actually do exist to people. And, um, and it's important that these people who generally are um, oppressed, disadvantaged, marginalised, voiceless, do have that platform to be heard. And, um, and cinema seems to be one of the most effective mediums to do so, um, as you know, we're talking visual, narrative, um, and all the aspects of cinema, sound design, um, all those different um, creative aspects that can really engage and make a, a really strong impression on audiences. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing, particularly in the social justice film space, uh, particularly over the last five years, is. Um, the rise of the impact campaign. So now social justice films um, aren't merely just showing uh, the issues that are happening globally or locally. Uh, they are actually expanding the conversation beyond the cinema, um, working with communities, making strategic plans uh, for positive, tangible social change. Um, and this is kind of the first time that we've really been seeing uh, an actual job of an impact producer, someone whose job it is to make sure that the film doesn't doesn't end when when the credits roll. It it continues. It has a life afterwards, and hopefully, it will lead to a further engagement within the issues. Um, this is something that we've seen over the last few years, and probably one of the best examples I can think of, particularly at the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival, is Chasing Asylum, which. Um, I, I hope a lot of you have seen. Um, if not, you should absolutely see it. Uh, we held the Australian premiere in 2016, uh, which pretty much exposed uh, the issues um, and what was actually happening on Nauru and Manus Island. Uh, it was the first of its kind to really be able to relay any sort of footage or information of the absolutely abhorrent uh, human rights abuses that were happening in these places. Um, and in Australia, as we hadn't really been exposed to any of that information previously, um, and it, we could see it in the media, we could see it in the social consciousness, it just blew the issue wide open and it became one of the most pressing, most talked about issues within the Australian kind of contemporary context uh, at that time in the middle of 2016 and is still ongoing. Um, and for me, just seeing the power of cinema and the influence that it had on people now, one, being informed about the issues and two, being engaged through the creative medium of cinema that had a, not only an informative aspect but an emotional pull as well, uh, was really powerful and it really did make me believe in the power that cinema and the arts have uh, in engaging with social justice issues. So um, that's it from me. Thank you. Um, yeah, just echoing Lauren, um, it's wonderful to be on this panel um, and uh, just to be able to speak with such a diverse range of practitioners. Um, when you do work as an artist, as I do, it is a little bit of a bubble, as Bill was saying. Um, I 
I work in my little hobbit hole and I like drawing and painting and writing stories and and sometimes people will say hey do you want to publish this or um, do you want to put a work in an exhibition at the Docklands Library and I'll say oh yeah sure and uh, and that's how it actually reaches people um, in that sense I guess I feel a little bit like an accidental activist. Um, I like to think of myself as, as, as uh, you know, trying to make a difference. Um, but interestingly, it's not something that I set out consciously to do. It's it's something that just happens almost incrementally. I guess that's true of all of us, and um, it 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 just comes from this almost like a, a basic need to redress some sort of imbalance. And we, we go through life and we see imbalances everywhere from a micro to a macro level. And uh, the question always resounds in the mind is what can I do? Um, especially, you know, I'm, I'm very motivated by films that I watch, especially documentaries about certain issues. And um, a lot of my work has actually been inspired by documentaries because um, firstly to see an art form can actually elevate an issue in an entertaining way into the consciousness and I think that's a key thing um, that art should be entertaining and often not talked about when well, we can't talk about entertainment you know in the arts but first and foremost I think a way of communicating is entertaining somebody I certainly know that with my four-year-old daughter um, if I tell her a story it's like uh, um, I start off by just saying you know um, once upon a time there was a really sad dragon and suddenly she's straight in there and, and we can start talking about issues. Um, the other thing is also you don't want to, you know, as a creator, you don't want to sermonise. Um, you know, we'll leave that to, you know, presidents and so on. Um, but the real way to connect with people and to achieve, um, as he was saying, that proximity, and that's what you're always trying to get is that proximity, is to understand that you probably know a lot less than other people. Um, you you have a shared emotional uh, landscape, you know, I think all people are pretty much the same, um, but you can actually get close to other people by being quite humble in the way you express things and also very open and most importantly not didactic. Um, so I've never actually written a story, um, at least none that I've liked, um, let alone allowed to be published, um, that had a message. And the best stories for me are the ones where I don't really know what they're about, but I feel that there's some kind of transcendental truth coming through me, not, not that I'm sermonising or telling anybody anything, but I've received some kind of idea that feels like it's worth sharing. And then after that, it's, it's up to what other people think. Um, so to give an example, um, in the exhibition, the work that I contributed after after Bill invited me to to show something. Um, I don't know if you thought of the work, Bill, or if I thought of it, but we both thought of the same thing anyway. It, and it was an illustration uh, for a story called um, Alert But Not Alarmed. And it's a very, very short story. Um, and basically, um, this I'll, I'll tell you where the story came from. Um, I was catching a, a taxi in New Zealand and just chatting with the taxi driver. It's often a great source for, for um, narrative beginnings. And uh, he was a Lebanese taxi driver. And I don't know how the conversation turned to um, conflict and, and war, but um, it wasn't so much about that, but the fact that as a kid he remembered um, a gang of friends had discovered a unexploded missile in their neighbourhood. And this was very exciting because um, they could take it home, cut it up and sell the parts for money. And so they were often looking for these unexploded weapons. And um, this image floated around in my head for a long time, not, not because I seized on it, it just kept coming back like a recurring dream of, of kids playing with a missile as a, as a fun thing. And in the same way that, you know, growing up in the outer suburbs of Western Australia, we would play in a um, burnt out car wreck or old old discarded washing machine or an old fridge. That's what kids do, play in an old fridge <laughs> and, and not be aware of any sort of, uh, just be oblivious to kind of any sinister, sinister undertones. So um, the story, and at the same time I wrote the story was when um, the Howard government was sending out um, these uh, 
little fridge magnet things um, in the war against terror saying, be alert, not alarmed. And I just, I thought that's such a great phrase because you could invert it and it tells you what they're really doing, what the Coward government really wants. They want you to, to be alarmed, not alert, i.e. not alert to the discourse that they're peddling. Um, and by sending out all these things that you stick on your fridge, it's, it's trying to actually uh, lull you into some kind of fog of um, not questioning what the government's doing and feeling like you're safe, which you're not, because you've got a government that's not necessarily trustworthy. So um, I just thought that was a great title. Um, be, a, uh, be alert, not alarmed. So a story's called Alert not, But Not Alarmed. And it just ended up just being a, almost like a story about a false memory from childhood that, um, you know, when we were kids, the government gave us missiles to look after in our backyards. And the reason was to reduce pressure on armed storage facility, but most importantly, to give everybody the sense that they're participating in national defence. So it's not such an abstract thing. Hey, you can actually polish your rocket every Sunday. You can actually check the oil level by pulling a dipstick out the side and top it up if you need, need it topped up. And for a while I sat with that idea, but an idea by itself isn't a story, and it also risked sounding a little bit didactic or, you know, trying to make some sort of comment um, which was slightly artificial. But the most interesting part was then I, when I, you know, when I write a story or, or draw something, I really do my best to imagine that it's a real thing, you know. I, it's not making up a story. I think about it to the extent where it, it almost does become a real memory, and it has to have the texture of reality and for me, what would be logical is that if we did have a missile like that in our backyard and everybody else had one like that, we would probably start decorating it with paint. Like we'd be painting it nice colours, which we'd be trying to make it part of the garden, um, maybe string it with Christmas lights and things like that. So in this story, the average residents, they've had it for so long, they're getting a little bit sick of it, they're starting to decorate it. And then they go, well, let's look, you know, some of these wires and stuff don't need to be inside, so let's take some of those out because it could make a really good dog kennel, the bottom part of the missile. And if you hollow out the top, you can make a really nice pizza oven and you can do all these other things. And then at the end, it's, um, you know, just sort of ends with the scene of um, everybody's got their Christmas lights on their missiles because it, it shows so well your house in the street. And um, if you go up to the top and look at the whole suburb, it's just beautiful to look at with all the missiles covered in Christmas lights. And then it occurs to people, you know, if, if, uh, if the government calls on us to deploy the missiles, they're, they're probably not going to work anymore. Um, but we're just gambling on the fact that we hope whoever is in the other country with missiles pointed at us, they're doing exactly the same thing. And I think the, what, what resonated for me in writing that story was the fact that nobody actually wants a war. You know, the average person doesn't want a war. And average people want the same things that everybody else wants and it tends to be governments and politicians that orchestrate a situation that manufactures a desire for war because nobody actually wants it. Um, and also um, I have a quite a pessimistic view of the world but I think um, the deep optimism is in um, human nature and that there is a there are better qualities that trump the negative qualities. So love will trump hate if given the opportunity um, poor choice of words maybe there, but um, you know, I think as an artist I'm trying to find ways of exploring that idea but also doing it honestly and, and not trying to come up with um, something, I'm not trying to come up with a realisation that the reader themselves doesn't already have, you know, I think a good piece of art, whether it's a cartoon or a performance or a film, is really about telling somebody something they already know but haven't thought of before. That's basically it. So I'll, I'll end on that note. Thank you. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here too um, because when I was young, I actually wanted to be an artist. Um, but I was also a very argumentative child, full of excuses. So one day, my very exasperated year three teacher said, Reiko, you should become a lawyer. And, um, <laughs> and clearly, she was, um, she was influential. But um, before I got qualified as a lawyer, I used to be a journalist. Um, and I still write um, today. So for me, 
um, you know, today's theme of art and human rights is always um, closely um, intertwined. To me, to me, art is um, art is about capturing the moment in in an authentic way and telling the the whole story with your full self. And I think this is precisely what we need today, um, when actually tr the, you know truth is stranger than fiction nowadays. It seems if you think about you know the things that are happening in offshore detention or you know, the presidential tweets that come out every day. I mean, you couldn't really make this, this stuff up, really. And you know, the scary part is that you know, in this age when we're told to constantly you know, commodify ourselves and, and brand ourselves, we, we're not expressing ourselves authentically. Um, we are so disconnected from reality, um, alienated from each other, and out of touch with ourselves that um, I think art is perhaps the only thing that could really um, save us. And um, of course, you know, art is not really um, a means to an end. Um, you know, the finished artwork isn't even what, what it's all about. Um, it's probably the creative process that's the most valuable thing. But if I can be a bit um, utilitarian um, for a moment, um, I guess the thing about art and human rights is that you know, art is something that is um, expressive in a way that moves people by, by definition. I think that can be um, a definition of art. And so, of course, it can um, bring people's attention to particular issues and um, get people thinking. But I suppose the other thing more broadly is that um, we've come to a point in our civilization where we really need to treat this sick culture itself um, that treats people, um, humans, as um, disposable. So I think art is um, how we can um, approach this rather than um, strict rights, um, perhaps. And I think that connects with what um, Hugh was saying um, in the beginning. And um, I think that art is something that demands um, courage, courage to be honest, um, and to confront and unpack uncomfortable truths, and it's not really enough to, um, to, you know, to label war or poverty as negative. What we really need to do is to identify and interrogate, you know, the, the systematic mechanisms of our society and even, you know, the darkness that each of us carry inside us. And I think this is precisely what the um, exhibition downstairs, um, you know, prompts you to think about. So I hope um, everyone will have a chance to um, check it out if you haven't um, already. Um, that's, that's it for me for now. Thank you. Um, my plug for human rights generally at the start, and it, and it draws on something that Bill said, which is the, the exhibition's not just about the, the conflict of war, but the preconditions to establish lasting peace, about justice, about um, sharing, about love. Um, and um, when we look at the human rights landscape, when we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I often come back to why we had this amazing international consensus in 1948, and it was because of the horrors of World War II. It was because of what we saw with the Holocaust and the mass displacement of people and um, the, the killing and all of that trauma. And you had this moment where the world community got together and said, here's this statement of core values, which we agree attach to every single human being, regardless of who you are or where you live. And um, we, as an international community, say um, that we will stand up for and defend these, um, uh, these core principles, these core values. And Australia was at the forefront of those discussions. Um, we we're actually arguing for it, for it to be stronger. We wanted an international court to enforce those, um, th those values. Um, Bill and I were, were talking about it last year, and those values are still incredibly modern and relevant, even though they were written 70 years ago. And, um, and we need to remind ourselves that after the horrors of World War II, 
these are the things that we agreed as an international community were the preconditions to establishing lasting peace, prosperity and development. Um, the, the other thing, just reflecting on some of the comments, uh, I was at a conference last year, uh, the Progress Conference um, brought together 120 people uh, like me from uh, NGOs across the country to talk about making Australia a better place. And uh, they invited a futurist from the, from the US and there was about 100 people and 120 people in the room. And he said, where are the artists? And two people put their hand up and he said, well, you're the most important people in this room because when we're advocating, the audience hears, you're asking me for something. But when an artist is providing art that's about human rights or justice or environment, um, you're giving me something. And it just reflected on some of uh, what, the, what, what the comments that were made there. So with that, um, we, I might open it up for questions or comments. Um, yeah, in the front row. I'd just like to ask, is there a technical reason, rather than a purely political and corrupt moral reason, that we can't speed up processing? Is there something, is there something technically wrong that we can't, you know, we leave people in, in some fetid jail cell for years, and is there, is there a technical reason that we can't speed, at least speed up processing, or is it just some kind of political uh, means, means by which people are detained. Is it, is it that? I mean, is, is, it, is there a reason why, is there a technical reason why we haven't sped up processing? Good, good. I just asked a question. This is a view here. Uh, if anyone asks a question, can you please repeat the question? Because they don't, they don't have a the audience, so repeat the question before you Yes, so just for the recording, uh, the question was, um, and sorry to summarise, uh, um, is there a technical reason why it's taken so long to process refugee claims in Australia? And uh, the answer is not really. Um, so um, there was, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but basically there were thousands of people um, whose claims were um, deliberately stalled by the government while they sought to push through temporary protection visas in the Australian Parliament. And so, um, uh, and then the government turned around after years of saying you cannot, so the migration law says you cannot apply for a protection visa unless the minister says it's okay for you to apply. And there's nothing you can do to try and force the minister to do it. So the minister in 2008, Chris Evans said, I feel like I have the power of God under this legislation. And that power has only intensified since 2008. So there are all these personal non-compellable discretions in the minister. Um, and the minister said, no one can apply until I get these TPVs through and use the kids on um, Christmas Island, their, their liberty as a bargaining chip to get through. If people remember with Ricky Muir um, was the casting vote for that and he said I've got the kids out of detention but it's also brought in temporary protection visas and all these other bad changes. Um, then the government turned around and said you have to apply by 31 October was it or 1 October um, and impose this arbitrary deadline and then that put intense pressure on the people and their advocates cut all the legal assistance and that, that's been working through with pro bono lawyers and volunteer lawyers and, and so um, uh, it's incredibly arbitrary and unfair and, and intensified the stress on people who had already gone through so much. Can I just say, I'd just like to ask Bill something if I may, not a lot of the state and something. You mentioned that you're self educated. Uh, no, I was slowly. Yes. Well, the uh, my neurological problems um, cause me to have learning difficulties too, and I'd like to say thank you showing me that success can be had through um, education and self-education. You, uh, you have inspired me, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, um, that's going to be hard for me to sort of speak uh, to relative to uh, the what's being recorded, but what was just suggested uh, without any self-aggrandizing was that uh, it is important that there are some role models of people either have 
uh, some sort of a learning a disability, or in my instance, somewhat slow learning sort of thing, that can continue to plot along as I do, and, and maybe help to influence some things. So thank you for your comments. <laughs> Other questions? In the middle. I'm just thinking that the people here and you people are very aware of human rights and the sort of people who go to exhibitions, go to workshops or talks, but I'm thinking how do we get through to people who just just not in their mind brain, who are just in their own little world and just don't relate to these bigger human rights issues? How do we get that audience? So I'll repeat the question and then hand over to our experts. Uh, so the question is, how do we get beyond uh, the self-selection of people who are interested and motivated to learn and engage with these issues to the broader public uh, who's, uh, with my addition, if politics is what's going to drive change in this country and politics is driven by public opinion, how do we change public opinion? <laughs> Um, you know, that is a constant question that we have to ask ourselves at the festival. Um, so as we're not just preaching to the choir in this case. Um, and it is, it is very difficult because obviously our audiences are people who do care about these issues. But I think it, what's interesting is it's a very um, broad spectrum of people's experience or knowledge with um, certain issues um, or events that are being portrayed in the, in the film. So there may be people who are, you know, quite well informed and experts, and people who actually don't know anything and, and they'd like to learn more. So there there is um, still a hunger in our audiences um, for those who do know a lot and may not. Um, but I think you know, just a really important way, even just to begin to have a conversation, is uh, being being able to listen and being able to engage because no one's going to listen to you if you don't listen to them as well. So it is also about engaging in respectful dialogue as well um, and you can only hope that it will work well but uh, yeah, in order to really be able to have those conversations then there does need to be a, a mutual respect. Yeah, I'll, I'll chip in in agreement with that. Um, I think uh, that's, that's the most important thing is firstly to I think that's a really great question, by the way, because I'm asking it myself all the time. It's like, <laughs> am I just like um, uh, speaking to people who already agree with me? Um, I hope not. And I think um, one one thing is it needs to be a sort of a, a self-critical or self-reflexive thing is to be constantly asking, um, what is my proximity to the people who have who disagree with me, whether through ignorance or through a um, alternative political views and uh, I think yeah respect is the key thing is is to actually respect um, people who uh, would not be interested in what I do and I think that's that's something to really think about the other answer too is um, I do a lot of work with kids and and that is a great way to actually at least to plant some seeds of uh, questioning in kids, so that if you know, I'm not. I don't have an agenda or any kind of mission statement. But if I if I was forced to give one, it would be I'd like to make kids ask more interesting questions about the world, and the answers they have might be quite different to my own, and that's okay. But as long as they're asking those questions, and I think film, good films are like that too. Is that the really good films? They don't actually beat a drum about a particular point. They just ask a really beautifully crafted question, and that's the thing: is the idea of a beautiful question, um, and it doesn't have to be complex or or laboured or anything. It just has to has to be quite, um, you know, moving. Um, as as Roko said, it's like art is it it has to move you in some way, and so if you can move people, um, and also at the same time try and be apolitical in doing it, like when I tell a story, I try to make it pretty apolitical. I mean, I have quite, you know, left-wing views, but I try not to, uh, they're in the first draft and then I take them all out. Um, I try to extract my own opinions and beliefs. And I like to, th when I have a story, um, uh, one thing I scan for is could a, a far-right religious fundamentalist get something out of this story? And if, if the answer is yes, then I think I've done a good job because um, I, I consider that sort of person the very opposite 
to me in the way they think, but I'd still like to, to communicate with them, even if it's just to confirm their own views or something. I just like to have some kind of influence that way. And as did I come across the writings of people like Kurt Vonnegut and, and some of the other poets and writers who have helped change my way of thinking about the world. The, but I, I think it's a great question. I think that any of us who are involved in this sort of uh, area think about it a great deal. And I'll, I'll give a, a, a small example. In 1993, I had an exhibition out at the uh, Museum of Modern Art at Heidi. And the... Uh, and it was about issues of uh, violence and nonviolence, uh, about nonviolence. Uh, and and one of the reviewers took quite a long time, it was quite a large section. Uh, so I was quite honored that he decided to take that much time to really tear it apart, something terrible. Uh, but the upshot was this line, which I quote every time I get a chance, and I actually even every now and then put it in some of my artworks. I, I've scanned it and I try to insert it into certain things. And, and part of the review said, uh, something like, as laudable as it may be, right, or its intentions may be, uh, images to do with war and violence are always more compelling. Right? And I thought, wow, this is where we are. This is that if you, if you have something which shows aggression, which shows the blood on the floor, if you show something which is uh, uh, about, you know, uh, uh, how we treat others in a really negative way, they're more powerful images, according to this particular reviewer in the Australian, and I can't remember what the name of the guy is that owns the Australian. But anyway, the, the idea being that it helped to focus my mind because I had no bloodshed in this, uh, and, and you will even notice in the exhibition here that where there's red, it's usually on a rose or on a flower or on something else. It is, it's, it's not blood. Right? It, this is not a thing about aggression. It's about trying to find gentle ways to raise these questions heartening thing is that art works around the clock, 24 hours a day, on some walls somewhere around the world. And I've noticed that over the years, been in this for a while, that rarely saw exhibitions which had the sort of sensitivity of Sean's or the, some of the sensitive many of the artists who are here. Very recently in New York in the Queens Museum, there's a major exhibition by Peter Schumann who has a work in this show. Peter's 80-some years old, and it's the first time he's actually had a museum exhibition right, to do with his values, uh, to do with peace and, and social justice. It's a growing concern. Incrementally, people walk into the library who didn't expect to see this show or see this book or do this and are coming across it. And so it's hard to promote it. We don't have the money in the arts, the $200 billion to build the armaments next year. We don't have that money, but we can continue to find walls and ways and, and conversations. So it, it's a slower process, but I think it's a solid foundation. No, and I was just going to add, based on what Sean said about reaching people in different ways, um, I, I remember the, there was a, a rally to free David Hicks when he's still locked up at, um, in Guantanamo. And it was at Federation Square on like a Saturday afternoon, and I went along. Um, and the, the audience in the rally was pretty much um, dads, well-dressed dads, um, who um, Terry Hicks, his story about trying to get his son out of uh, a horrific jail, um, you know, where all, it was so hard to do that, and, and all the advocacy he did spoke to dads 
who cared about their children and who turned up to that rally and there was a speaker from the ACTU who talked about work choices and went down like a lead balloon. They, they were there for one thing, they were there for the love of a father with a son to get him out of there. The church um, cathedral behind us had a big banner saying free David Hicks, so the church is actually coming out and saying it. So th this was a story that transcended politics and um, actually reached people through that human connection. It's not a story about art, but I think it speaks to how art uh, and advocacy can reach different people in different ways. Um, the other observation is, you know, Nick Hutt's photo there was prolific. If you look at the photo of Island Curdy, um, that was everywhere in the media. So there are images that um, uh, you cannot avoid as a human being in a world where media is everywhere um, that have a powerful impact on you and have a powerful impact on public opinion. And I had a question, because my wife's a public artist, um, doesn't this reinforce the role of the importance of public art in the sense that Bill's talking about bloody every monument out there, the cannons in my local park that the kids play on, um, uh, and the monuments to all the explorers who um, discovered unoccupied Melbourne, um, or Macmillan who um, was involved in the massacres in Gippsland, um, and there's a federal seat named after him. Um, isn't there, it doesn't this speak to the importance of public art in recontextualizing those monuments like we saw at the Batman monument where, um, what was it, sibling, you know, there's been plaques to try and <laughs> contextualize that monument. So actually it wasn't unoccupied when um, Batman arrived here and then um, City of Melbourne ran a, um, an exhibition where it actually turned the monument on its head and said, what do you think about the, the um, errors of history here, the whitewashing of history. Um, any comments about the importance of public art in this context to take the art to the people? Um, it's been so great listening to everyone's contribution. Um, there's so many things that you've all said resonated with me because I'm an artist and I've sort of found myself being an accidental activist this year because I did a portrait of Julian Triggs for the Archibald. So my earliest ideas were much more sort of politically symbolic and then I refined it and I realised what was most important was to strip her back the fear of her symbolism because what she stood for was political enough and that I really needed to speak to people who liked her or didn't like her from all kind of sides and what their personal beliefs were. And I felt that the article was a mainstream kind of reach a huge, huge audience and kind of I wanted to tap into that audience. And I realised that the topics that she represents are things that are so heated on social media, but as soon as you bring it into a gallery context, you have um, conversations that are much more respectful and so people um, can talk about them in this sort of hushed tone that you just don't really get on, on Twitter or Facebook, which I find really, um, in a way, can be really dehumanising and we've seen so much um, abuse. Um, but I guess the other thing I wanted to say was, yeah, I feel like as artists, we, we're sort of tapping in on an emotional level to people. Um, and, and I had to work so hard to make a picture that was, um, that people who, made, oh, there was a comment I read in the Australian, someone said, oh God, I hope that portrait of Julian doesn't win the article, that would be terrible, but the pain is not bad. And so, <laughs> so I had to work at the best of my ability, that it couldn't be faulted as an image and that would just kind of um, speak to people on all sides. What I think, though, the change that needs to happen, and I think someone touched on it, and it really is from leadership in the political realm, I think, where policy needs to change. And I'm just interested in what your views are on how do we inspire the people that we need to be going into politics to actually think that is a legitimate career for them. 
I mean, I look at the Prime Minister now of New Zealand and I think, well, there's a um, woman in leadership that would be a wonderful role model for Australia, but how do we inspire Australians with maybe more progressive views and younger generations that rather than going into other kind of you know, law or um, social advocacy of some other kind and using their voices in that way, and I think there are many people who can do, but we need to bring them into politics, I think. Well, what are your ideas about that? You have a summary of that statement. Yeah. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Hello, it's Yvette, isn't it? Yes, nice to meet you. We've met, we've met on uh, social media. There you yeah. go. Um, so Yvette, who painted a portrait of um, Gillian Triggs, um, which was in the Archibald, was just talking about um, how uh, you know that the you know Gillian has experienced such a bitter views against her and such great support um, for her. I mean, she's told the story that, you know, after all the stuff, when they were trying to oust her from her position, I think she got a standing ovation on a plane when she walked in and has had people knitting stuff for her and sending her, so it's polarising, but when when her image is pre presented in a gallery context, suddenly um, everyone is having respectful <laughs> conversations about that and it takes the heat out of it and there's... Um, people are, are willing to be more inquisitive, I guess, or to suspend their polarised views, and, and that's part of and the role of art. It's a very humanising image yeah. through a portrait. So, yeah. yeah, and a humanising image as well. And then the question was, how do we get more progressive politicians, um, uh, and looking at Jacinda Ardern or others, to, to say, you know, why... why why are people turned off from politics and how do we change politics to make it more progressive? Would anyone like to take that question? Or not politics, Rayco. Um, no, it's, it's interesting, but in, in some places, no. <laughs> In some places in the world, though, um, with you know, we I, I think it is a privilege and luxury that we can actually still, in this age, um, you know, treat life as sort of business as usual, peaceful. Because in in a lot of places in the world, um, in repressive societies, um, you know, women doing anything really, or you know, um, artists, you know, making art, like all of that is political, you know, political. So perhaps. Um, you know, perhaps we are we are lucky in that we can treat, you know, politics as something being something separate um, to us. Um, I I don't really know the the answer to the question of how to make um, you know running for office um, or, you know something on that level um, attractive. Um, but I suppose my uh, my point is that um, you know every decision we make and, you know, the conversations we have, um, it is something political. And I think we, we do make political statements with, with the decisions we make um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and so maybe we, we can just be more um, aware and um, mindful of what we do um, every day. I don't know if that satisfactorily <laughs> answered your question. Yeah. The federal parliament. Um, it, it's rare that artists actually go to politics. However, there are a few prime examples. One whom some of you, one whom some of you, one whom some of you would know. Uh, one is a, a guy named Gunter Grass, who's a, a, a Nobel laureate author. Right? He has actually has an artwork. G Gunter Grass. Uh, he was a green politician in Germany. Uh, for some years, and and there have been a few examples of artists who have moved into politics. Vasilis Havel. Who's that? <laughs> yes, Peter Garrett. Uh, yeah, Havel, yeah. whose poetry is, you know, on in the exhibition. Vaslav Havel, who has a a a uh, concrete poem in the exhibition here, who is a uh, playwright, dramatist, uh, and uh, an artist who was the leader of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, um, who became a, a, a politician. Uh, 
Dimitri Grass never stopped writing, and nor did he stop making his artwork, although he did stop being a politician at a certain point. Um, and certainly, uh, Peter Garrett stopped being a politician also at a certain point. Uh, but um, it doesn't, uh, the, the artists becoming politicians doesn't necessarily help to change things always for the better, because they move into a system which is very complicated and very difficult to deal with in, I think, a, a, a often an honorable way and, and a, an ethical way. So unless you get a tipping point where you have enough artists or others, people who stay true to their ethical position and not just vote the party line, we will have trouble, which is probably why we're getting more independents who can just say, this is what I believe in, whether we agree with them or not, this is what I believe in, this is what I'm going to do. with a uh, political agenda who can't find a space in a, a party and they look at all the parties, they read the dossiers and they go, gee, there's not a sufficient number of things I agree with, I'll strike out on my own. Isn't that a good thing, potentially? And then a person... Like, like Corey Bernardi? Hey? Like <laughs> Corey Bernardi? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm joking. But, um, uh, yeah, I think you're, you're seeing, yeah, so the, the question is should we have more independence, not like Corey Bernardi. Um, I think you're seeing in politics, you know, increasing dissatisfaction with the, the, the two major parties and that's leading to the growth in, in smaller parties and independence. Um, I would say in my experience in dealing with politicians, there are many very honourable politicians who are working bloody hard to um, uh, advance human rights and advance um, what's best um, for Australia and for the world. Um, and often what you get in the media, because the media feeds off conflict, is the worst of politics. And so people's perceptions of politics is the absolute worst of it. And some of what you're seeing with the marriage equality debates happening right now in Canberra, um, is the best of politics where politicians from across the parties and, and we work very hard on this issue um, to get cross-party support and you had, um, you know, Richard Di Natale, you know, you had all the LGBTI politicians in the Senate standing together, for, sorry, not all of them, but across the parties supporting Liberal Senator Dean Smith's bill um, and it's a really great moment when you have um, a, an issue like that transcend um, the, the political divide. Um, and, and you also saw that with the response to the, the postal survey where, um, you know, you had majority support for a, a human rights issue. But, of course, when you don't have majority support, you know, human rights aren't a popularity contest. They're inalienable. They belong to every single one of us. But for those of us who are trying to change things, it makes it so much hard when you have the less popular um, uh, groups in society um, whose human rights are at stake. And in 2009, when there was a national human rights consultation about whether or not we should have a human rights act, there was actually social research done. Um, so heaps of submissions to this consultation, majority supported stronger human rights protection, um, but. The, the committee that was doing the consultation led by Frank Brennan actually did social research on a representative sample of Australians and um, found that there was strong support for increasing human rights protections, um, but said that, found that there was a hierarchy of sympathy depending on whose protections you were talking about. And so um, they asked the question, should these groups have more or less human rights protection? And when you had the elderly, children, um, uh, Aboriginal people in remote communities, people with a disability, there was strong support, but going down, um, Aboriginal people living in the cities, um, LGBTI people, um, and then when you got to asylum seekers, people seeking asylum and refugees, you had um, people, there was more support for stripping back their human rights protections than there was for increasing them. And it didn't have people in prison, for example, on the list, but that would have been uh, presumably even lower. So. Uh, the, the less popular people are, the harder it is to get the human rights protections. Um, poli the politi political system is set up as a popularity contest um, and we need to explain why to people whose human rights aren't threatened, why the human rights of others who are, are important to them and why as a society we will be stronger, healthier, uh, more prosperous, more stable, more peaceful 
um, if we ensure those human rights protections for every single one of us. Um, we might have time for one, two, one or two more questions. Two more. I'm thinking the art world is really wild and to be successful and to survive to by making art is really hard. So uh, my question was, do you think there's um, a good, good support for artists working with human rights in this country? And yeah, that was my starting question. Can it be better? Or? So the question is, is, uh, is there good support for artists working on human rights issues? Oh, and uh, there's another part of my question, which was um, art, the way art is valued in the art markets and things like that, um, how does it relate, like what makes, how can we make human rights art about human rights more valuable? Yeah. And how can and we make art, art yeah. Yeah. So how can we increase the value of the art that is about human rights? That is a very good question. Um, uh, I think I might have how we can create more value maybe to the artists, but uh, I think in my personal opinion, no, there isn't enough support for artists that are dealing with these issues. Um, and, you know, I guess supposing within the art scene that there are the more prominent artists that get the funding and get the big galleries and get all that support because they, they've, they've made it, they're established, they're esteemed. Um, but there are struggling artists who are dealing with these issues because people don't want to deal with them. Um, and that causes a problem. And um, I can actually, you know, say as a human rights film festival, you know, we, we are constantly looking for support for our festival. We aren't um, heavily funded by, we're barely, I don't even think we are. Oh, I'm not entirely sure of our government funding, but it's certainly not enough to run a festival, whereas a lot of other film festivals and arts festivals have a lot of support and funding. And it, it's kind of upsetting when we feel like we're um, really portraying really important films and, really import and we're really supporting um, artists and inclusivity and diversity and championing artists from these backgrounds who have an authentic um, voice and perspective on these issues, but we feel like we, it's really hard to get that support. So I think there needs to be more support just as someone who is working with artists and within the arts community. But, you know, all arts organisations have their own kind of struggles when it comes to these things as well. But in terms of creating, being able to create more value for your art, I think that needs to go to one of the artists for that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky because the you as an artist you're working in a certain art market. Um, I had a, a was facing kind of a choice early on of whether I wanted to say be the kind of artist um, who exhibits in a gallery and, and sells work in a gallery and, and that sort of and try aim for that that kind of career, or to work in publishing. And I went for publishing because I felt that. Um, even though you, you make a pittance, <laughs> um, especially when I started off um, working with uh, picture books, it was like, um, it was dire, you know. But uh, you, over the years, I think I've reached way more people. Um, in, there does seem to be a general rule of an inverse relationship between profitability and artistic reach. Okay, we all know that. Um, and so I've, in my career, I've done a lot of different things and um, I've worked on, you know, Hollywood films and so on and then I've worked on tiny little theatre projects and I can tell you the ones which are more creatively satisfying. Um, but somewhere in between, I think there is, uh, they're not, they're not it, you know, there's that general pattern but there's also possible that things can be both, you know, that you can actually do something that is commercially viable and I've devoted a lot of my career to sort of figuring out what is something that's commercially viable but also has authenticity. It's got like a integrity and is actually going to make the world a better place rather than a more um, <laughs> audio-visually polluted place, which it kind of is at the moment. And um, 
you know, it's tricky, but basically your, your question is just something that you just have to be asking yourself constantly. I mean, the answer to that question is that you have to keep asking the question all the time and figuring out what can I do, because there is no straight answer. And it's, it's a tough road being an artist. Um, and you don't get points for, you know, um, you know, how noble your virtues are and things like that. Uh, but the main thing to focus on is just producing good art. And, and even regardless of message or intention, um, so I'm always just telling people, just learn to draw really well, okay? Forget about your political message or any of that, just draw really well and then worry about the, you know, the content will naturally flow once you have that agency and, and facility with a medium and the ability to, to express and connect in a way that's almost like more from the heart than the head. Um, and if you can lead from the heart, then all the other stuff will follow and you can, you know, people... People are hungry for, for, you know, good human rights related artwork. They're really hungry for it, but it has to be good art. The message, it's not just a good message or something. It's got to be like good art, whatever that is. I mean, we're all trying to figure it out, but, you know, it's a, it's a constant dilemma. And, and I'd add to that, that it isn't, uh, Sean used the word human rights art. Uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of a, a, the, most of the work that's in that exhibition is on loan from the archive of humanist art. So humanist art isn't necessarily human rights art. It's just about uh, about the state of being human, about how we relate to each other and things. And I do agree really totally with the idea that you know, learn to make good pictures, um, learn to draw or whatever is required in order to get your the message across or the ideas across, the way you feel across. And if you're a decent, reasonable, caring human being, the work will be meaningful. Right? It doesn't, I, I never do anything that's political, I never point the bone, I, that doesn't matter to me right now in a sense, you know, it does matter, but you say that it's not about the politics, it's about the fundamentals within the society, and if you get the fundamentals changed, then the society will raise up more and you will get better people helping to run the society, and I, I really truly believe that. But one of the things about the survival of an artist, which is a very, very difficult thing, and Sean John made absolutely the right decision. Uh, I can't remember what the phrase was that he said that he, he looked to see which was not more commercially viable, but more economically more plausible. Uh, reach, yeah. uh, and also um, creative <laughs> freedom. Yeah. Uh, freedom to make mistakes as well. Yeah, uh, and, and I made the other decision to just say, well, I'm just gonna make things that I think are important to me, and they have no commercial value at all out there. Right? Uh, that continues by and large, right? Uh, but I do have people who are interested in what I do and they say, can I hang this on a wall here or can we do this, this, there? And I'm, I'm ever so grateful and I have been able to get by. But if you look at the difficulties that artists face, one, if you're doing work which has strong sensitivities that really deal with deep human concerns, you will not find most of those in the commercial galleries in our cities around the world. The reason for that is that you don't usually find those in the corporate boardrooms or in the lobbies of the corporate the corporations or purchased as part of the acquisitive sort of mainstream of corporations, multinationals and others that have money because much of that work is, uh, does not necessarily always sit well behind a counter as far as they see. Uh, so work which is challenging is not work which they necessarily want to put forward because they have a product to sell. They have a brand that they want to stay with. And so most of the work which is purchased for most of these major collections are works which are, are not in this vein. And therefore, and they're purchased from commercial galleries. And commercial galleries then limit to some sizable extent in Australia and often overseas. The, the, the kind of work which they get because although they might respect this other work, if they don't have a market for it, they can't keep their doors open. And so it's not pointing the bone at anybody, it is just an economic reality. Changing sensitivity so we get more people in boardrooms who want to acquire work which is meaningful uh, uh, as well, I think would be a nice idea and it will help to keep you alive as an artist. And there, um, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, say thank you to my fellow panelists for what was a really, um, I enjoyed the conversation. It was really thoughtful and considerate and it was nice to exercise my mind in different ways from it's normally exercised in my day job. 
Um, and a big congratulations uh, to Bill um, and to the library on putting together a really fantastic exhibition. Um, and I was, we were lucky enough to get a, a guided tour by Bill um, before, and I encourage everyone to take a look at the exhibition and um, uh, some of the ways Bill's worked with uh, students at Monash to um, amplify some of the messages and deliver them in different ways and, and engage the audiences. So um, thanks to the library, City of Melbourne, and Bill and fellow panellists, and thank you for coming. Cheers. Yeah.